On this episode, New York Times best-selling author and creator of the Kingdom Keeper series, Ridley Pearson. What up, Opinioneers? Welcome to episode 116 of the WDW Opinion Podcast. My name is Connor Brown, and I'm a former Walt Disney World cast member, author, blogger, travel agent, and a Walt Disney World expert whose passion is to help you plan for and daydream about your next perfect Walt Disney World vacation. If you are a new listener here, Welcome to the show. You've picked a very good episode to be a new listener on for sure, but feel free to go back and check out all of our old podcast episodes covering a wide variety of Disney-related topics. And you can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. If you are a longtime listener, welcome back. Thanks for being here. If you continue to enjoy the show, please do me a favor and consider sharing with the friend you think might enjoy it as well. If you're watching the show on YouTube, hello there. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to hit the like button on this video and subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time we post a new video here on YouTube. If you are listening and you ever want to check out the video version of the show, head over to youtube.com slash opinion and you can see all the other videos we have posted there. I am going to get right into it because this one is a really, really cool interview we have today with Ridley Pearson. He's awesome. Uh, I was a little nervous to record before uh, we got on the Zoom, but he was such a nice guy, so down to earth willing to answer any questions, and it just felt like we were having a conversation. It didn't feel like I was interviewing him at all. So without further ado, let's get into it, and we'll go over to my interview with Mr. Ridley Pearson. I'm so excited today. I am here with New York Times bestseller, author of over 50 books, including the Kingdom Keepers series, Ridley Pearson. Ridley, thanks so much. There he is. Thanks so much right. for being here. So fun to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So we have a lot to cover. Um, I think I have some really cool questions. Um, we're going to have a lot of I fun. can't answer them. Oh, uh, well, hey, you can plead the fifth on one of them. I'll give you that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I do want to start at, at kind of the beginning because you've been sure. publishing books as far back. I think your first one was 1985, there, Excellent. thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. You had to have had the notion before 1985 that, you know, writing is what I'm going to do. That's going to be my job. Do you remember, was there a first moment or something that sticks out in your mind of, I know what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a writer. When did those ideas kind of start popping in your head? Well, you know, in a weird way, Connor, I still, I still think that every morning, Yeah, you know, um, it's it's an interesting question because I uh, you never at least I never seem to take it for granted that I'm a published writer. I think you know um, is anybody going to be interested at all in the next thing I write? And I think that every day it's like oh no no one's going to care, no one's going to be interested. And so I I came out of college and I was a singer songwriter for a number of years and. And I just adored it, but it was exhausting and um, it paid nothing. And in there somewhere, I started trying to write. And I actually, I was, um, I looked back at it at one point and I had been writing for six hours a day, six days a week for eight and a half years before I sold anything. Wow. I had, I'd written a ton of magazine stuff, but I didn't consider that what I was going to end up doing. And, you know, I don't think I ever... And and when you sell a first, well, I don't know about anymore, but when I sold my first book, it was, um, it was enough to buy a microwave oven. <laughs> I had been working. I, I think I figured it out at one point, and I had been working for less than ten cents an hour. Wow! 
um, for working on those books. So, you know, it's a privilege to be published. And I don't, and I've, uh, and, and through the pandemic, I really wasn't, people weren't interested in hiring me or working with me. And I thought, well, maybe this is the end. I mean, I've had a great run. I've done 62 books. I've been on the times list a dozen times. I've had a movie made, you know, all these different things, but you just want to keep doing it. Right. Um, and now thankfully once, once the pandemic, uh, chilled out a little bit, which, you know, now it's back up and roaring, but, um, there was a glimpse there where somebody opened a window and, and I now have, I have an eight book contract with Disney. I owe them two others. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm swamped for a decade here. Well, that's good. You know, yeah. sometimes being, no, it's fun. yeah, sometimes yeah. being super busy is good, but I, you oh, know, it is, the best. it is kind of reassuring too. And I, that, even with your success, you know, as myself, who's as a creative with, with his podcast and blogs and, and, yeah. and books and whatnot, it is kind of nice hearing in a weird sort of way that you still suffer from imposter syndrome a lot oh, of the time. Totally. Yeah, totally. And, and my dear friend, Dave Barry, who, who doesn't suffer from imposter <laughs> syndrome, but he does. I was, he was out uh, visiting a few weeks ago, visiting Idaho. And we happened to see him a couple of times, but, um, I was asking him what he was doing and he, and you know, same thing, I, same words could have come out of my lips. He said, well, I'm working on a novel. Not that I'm sure anybody's going to want to read it. Right. You know, yeah. it's just, we, we all feel that way. I think it's like, is, is this good enough that people are going to want to read it? Or if I just, you know, is it just a, a bad thing? Right. So you, you work and you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite. Um, I'm working on uh, one of the rewrites. Disney asked me to, um, rewrite the entire Kingdom Keeper series. So I'm, uh, I'm right now as we speak. Right behind the Zoom thing are these two manuscripts I'm comparing for Kingdom Keepers five to make sure the words that are in one are the words that need to be in the other. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about those rewrites because I think yeah, it's. So I mean, it's it's, it's never super ended. interesting. Yeah, and and you know your your first kind of of published works they had names like. Uh, never look back blood of the albatross which that is such a cool name good good job on that title uh, probable cause hard fall they're very you know suspenseful kind of 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 titles and and right. those were in the suspense genre what right, for adults yeah what drew you to that genre in particular for for creating a book yeah i mean it was everybody always says write what you know or write what interests you and I was and am um, a huge uh, mystery reader and watcher and streamer these days um, and suspense. I, uh, as, as a young man, not a kid, but as a young man in my 20s, I uh, was reading a contemporary of mine, um, Ken Follett, and, and all of his work, uh, which was Eye of the Needle and The Man from St. Petersburg and Key to Rebecca, all these incredibly well-written historical thrillers. I was also reading all of Ludlum um, and people like that. And it's just what I wanted to do. That's, that's where I'm, you know, I'm a wacko, crazy, homicidal person, which is, it's a good thing I have an outlet um, because I don't actually hurt anyone, but I do on the page. And it's just what I wanted to do. And, and honestly, as as our kids um, came into our lives and I started telling the kids stories at night and stuff, I became a little less interested in killing people and burning them and doing all of that. Uh, I mean, having kids, you know, changes your morality status and it changes everything. And I, uh, I was lucky enough in that I stumbled into um, writing a couple books for Disney, Peter and the Star Catchers with Dave Barry and the Kingdom Keepers. And and I loved it. And so I've been doing a ton of it. I still, uh, up until about three years ago, I was still writing thrillers. I have another thriller in mind. I haven't given it up entirely. but um, And now my kids are older and they'd probably rather read my thrillers than the books I'm writing. So, you know, life goes in this crazy circle. But uh, a lot of it is, you know, you write what you love and write what you know. And what I didn't know, I went out and researched for my thrillers and speaking to cops and the FBI and medical examiners and forensic psychiatrists. It's fascinating. 
So I was just always learning. And it's the same thing with the Kingdom Keepers is I'm just always learning. I've, I know we'll touch on this, but I've now been into the parks 31 times when they were closed. Oh, my gosh. Um, and, and, you know, to see all this stuff that nobody ever sees. And, and I just throw that all into my books. You know, what scared me hopefully scares you. Yeah. And you touched on a little bit about how having kids changed, uh, uh, you know, your mindset and, and what you were focused on. But how do you go from from something like Blood of the Albatross, a book called that, to diving into to Peter Pan? How are you able to shift your mind to that topic when you're writing about, like you're saying, gore and, and blood and, and, right. and, and crime? And I was writing, I mean, I literally was doing that when, when Dave and I um, had some success with Peter and the Star Catchers, and I was already prior to that, I had been working on Kingdom Keepers for a couple of years with Disney. Um, I got in the situation where I was writing every day. I was writing a th- parts of a thriller, parts of Peter and the Star Catcher, and parts of the Kingdom Keepers. And so I think it's like, um, and it didn't bother me at all. In fact, I found myself writing better. I mm-hmm. think because of it, because I had to. I had to just completely switch character setting, time, you know, fantasy versus really grim reality. Um, and it's probably like an attorney in a yeah. way, you know, attorneys have all these cases and they're really important, they're life and death. And yet they can go from one at 11 o'clock in the morning to one at one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And it's just, you just turn a switch and keep going. Flip the switch. Yeah. yeah flip the switch. The the Peter and the Star Catcher series was was so great and and that spurred the the Neverland series and it all focused on you know Peter Pan Captain Hook those classic characters but what I find fascinating is that those series were co written with with your good friend Dave Barry and I, I'm interested on in in how that works because I know like James Patterson has quote unquote co written a couple of right, books with right. President Bill Clinton I don't know how much. President Clinton is sitting at the typewriter cranking out chapters, you know, but Patterson, of course, is. When you have, you know, Dave Barry, a, a great author, a prolific writer, when you have yourself, a great author, a prolific writer, how do you guys come together to not just create a, a narrative that that is weaved together, but has a singular voice? It can't just be Ridley gets the even chapters. Dave gets the odd chapters, yeah. right? No, and that that's what we didn't know how to do this. We just, I was reading to my daughter, our oldest daughter, Paige, when she was five. She's 24 now. And um, she put her, I was reading Peter Pan, and she put her hand across the book and said, hey, Dad, how did Peter Pan meet Captain Hook in the first place? And wow. my little writer's light went off. And I went, wait a second. I don't know the answer to that, nor do I know how he can fly. I don't know why he can't, why he never grows old. I don't know where Tinkerbell came from. And I just said, hey, you know, that's its own book. So I was working all this through. And I was, uh, I play in a rock band with Dave Barry and Stephen King and Amy Tan and others. And I was down playing one of those shows in Miami and I was staying with Dave. And um, over breakfast, I mentioned this thing Paige had asked me. And I said, it just seems to me that there's a prequel to Peter Pan. And his eyes kind of kind of flared. And I said, wait a second, you know, would that interest you? Because um, at that time, you know, I killed people for a living <laughs> on, on, in books. And Dave wrote booger jokes. And so, you know, it occurred to us both that maybe we could make a lighthearted but suspenseful version of how just a regular boy becomes this iconic Peter Pan. And we both got excited about it until, as you say, we thought about, yeah, but how would we ever do this? And I was a huge outliner. Dave is not. And... um I, I felt that I really couldn't do it unless we outlined. So I think Dave came out here actually to Idaho and we spent three or four days shouting at each other over the kitchen table about what could happen in this book and what couldn't. Uh, and that got us closer. And then we realized, okay, now we have to write the book. And I just was not in, I, I in the meantime, I had read a few collaborative works, fiction written by two or more people and it just didn't appeal to me at all. You could totally tell who was writing what. You you never really followed the story because the voice changed so much. Um, it was jarring. 
And and I brought this up to Dave and I said, we've done all this work and uh, I'm just not sure we can even do this. I think it, it's going to end up a pretty lousy effort if you take odds and I take even. <laughs> and he said, well, let's you know sit on it for a few days and just see if anything comes to us. And I honestly, to this day, I can't remember who it was, but one of us um, called the other back and said, hey, what if, you know, as the thriller writer, I took the adult scary characters mm. and as a goofy, um, you know, snotty, booger writing, humorist, Pulitzer Prize winning Dave Barry, he could take the kids. And that if a chapter was mostly the kids in our outline, Dave would try the first draft. And then he would send it to me and I could do whatever I want to. I could, I could throw it all out and start it again. I could edit like nine words. I could change all the dialogue and send it back to him. And he could put it all back in the way he wanted. And that we would just sort of duke it out this way until we both thought, well, this is the best this chapter is going to be. Um, we've, we've gotten it. And, and so we did that and, and probably, and it was, you know, it was uh, slow most of the time because we would go back and forth five or seven times. Um, and there were times we would, one of us or the other of us would fight for a certain element. You know, I really like that paragraph or I really like the tone of that dialogue. Don't keep changing it. on me. Um, but we got used to the process. And by about halfway through the first book, and we wrote five of them, um, about halfway through the first book, we both, uh, Dave especially, who's just so freaking bright, but Dave understood immediately what was going to bother me or what I was going to want more of in his writing. And he just did it every time. By about halfway through the book, his stuff would come to me, and it was basically perfect. And I, being a little lame and a little slower, <laughs> I would keep trying things, and he would keep crossing them out and putting his own stuff in and, and improving it. Uh, but we did find this voice, you know, we found this voice that was both of ours and we wrote a little more toward that voice just to avoid all this edit hassle. Uh, but even so, I mean, there was a I think chapter 54 or something in Peter and the Star Catchers was rewritten 11 times. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, the rewriting did continue, but um, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the ones I've read where it's you write odds and I write even, I just can't, I can't get a third of the way into it. I just throw it across the room, but. Um, hopefully Dave and I did something where it's hard to see who did what. Oh, and in fact, yeah. he wrote some of the best suspense in the thing. I won't, I wouldn't even pretend I wrote the best humor, but I wrote some of <laughs> probably the worst humor in the book as well. But that's um, super interesting how you guys went about it. You know, you more adult, he more, more the kid stuff. And it's very similar to early animation styles that that walt disney did himself he oh. had a guy mark davis you draw the ladies like you're good at that man that's what you're doing and he never strain from from what you're you're good at but it all comes together in the end so yeah. i mean it totally worked with peter and the star catchers oh, for sure we had so much fun with those books and we you know we outlined them really hard we worked we worked um day and night on the outlining of those so that we knew our story was going somewhere. Um, we hoped it was going to please everybody because we, because we were writing for a younger audience, we intended to write slightly shorter chapters mm -hmm. and make them a little goofy and make them action. But the, the thing we wanted to find, and I hope we found was heart and, and writing heart is really tricky because if you, if you try to write heart, you write sappy. Yeah. Um, so you have to find a way to get heart into it, but in a way that doesn't come off as sappy. And I think the brilliant of humor, and this is where Dave contributed so much to these books is, you know, if you can tease each other, just right, you can show instead of tell the heart in it. And Dave is a master teaser. Um, he, he makes me feel about one inch small every time I'm with him. Um, and so he was able to put a lot of that heart that we wanted in it by just the counterplay between characters and being silly with each other. And um, it, it was really a fun process. I miss it. It was really, it was 10 years we wrote together. We wrote, I think, 12 books. And uh, it was just an amazing time.
how much um how much say did you guys have i know it, it became a play it was at the la jolla playhouse how yeah. much did you guys work work on that production thankfully none <laughs> Because if we had written it, it, it wouldn't have been suitable for even a middle school. <laughs> but that said, um, Disney in, in uh, Tom Schumacher, who runs Disney mm-hmm. Theatrical, was kind enough and generous enough. Uh, I wrote him an email and said, you know, Dave doesn't have interest in this, but I've my parents took me into Broadway my whole childhood. And I would just love, love, love to learn how you guys make this magic and is is it or would it ever be possible if i could just keep my mouth shut um to come and and watch you like a fly on the wall and most most production companies in film and things just say no to that yeah because they're afraid the author is going to come in and go how can you destroy my work you know um but tom bless his heart tom said uh Absolutely. We'll, we'll tell you what we're going to do and jump on a plane and come join us. And so I did for six years. Wow. Um, I followed the whole trail of how this thing went from our little book uh, to a very different, brilliant, funny piece of theater. Um, I was at La Jolla when it was workshopped. Um, I'd never seen a workshop, but workshopping is where a paid audience, very little money a seat, like 25 bucks a seat. They come in, 250 people come in, watch your play, and then you invite them to stay after. And usually about 50 of them do. And they tell you what's wrong with it. They tell you what they liked and what they didn't like. And the whole production staff sits up on the stage with yellow uh, notepads, and they take furious notes. And Rick Ellis, the brilliant Rick Ellis, would then go back to his um, hotel room each night and rewrite the play according to those comments. And when you... When you work with actors, this is where you learn what actors actually do, because these actors had memorized where they were going to be on stage and how they were going to move. They had memorized all their lines. They had memorized the songs. And then Rick would come in and deliver a script to them at nine in the morning with much of that changed. And by seven or eight that night, they would go on stage and do it perfectly the new way. Night after night after night after night, a changed line here, a changed spotlight over there, carrying something off stage you weren't carrying off stage before. How they can remember this and not think, well, what was I doing Tuesday? Um, is it just amazing to me? But they would change it and be perfect every night. It was just amazing. And the play incrementally changed, incrementally changed over this like 28-day period and ended a different play than it started up, started up. Yeah, it's in fact the best piece of music in the entire play was cut. Oh man. And to this day that breaks my heart, but they were running long and they looked at the script and they said, you know, the only thing where we're going to get 4 minutes out of this play is to cut that piece of music and they did and it worked mm. instead of drawing it out too long. It is crazy to think how much a living breathing thing a, a oh, play is. It's amazing. Yeah. How it for instance, yeah. there was this um, there was this part for um, the pirate, the black stash, the black mustache, and um, there was this actor named Christian Borel, and Christian just got it. He just understood that character from the moment this guy walked on the stage. You couldn't take your eyes off him. He just got it. He got the humor. He got everything about that character. And each night, Rick would take advantage of that. And and Black Stash would have another line or another scene or another joke. Um, And and it went on that way until, in many ways, it ends up Black Stash's play. Mm. And I don't honestly remember what day one was back when we first we first heard this in a, in the basement of a church in Manhattan. Oh, wow. We, we watched about four scenes that Rick had written be acted out. Dave came up for that one, and that was really fun. And I don't recall how much Stash was involved then, but I do know by the end of the workshop, he was everywhere in this thing because Christian Borle was such a phenomenal actor. He went on to win a Tony for it, and Tony since he's just a brilliant actor. But he, he Christian, 
um, all of the leads, all of the principles gave so much back to this that it turned it into an amazing play. Uh, very cool. And uh, I'm sure it was cool for you to see the transition oh, it made you yeah. know, from the book. I'm involved right now. A, a school back east is turning one of my uh, one of my sort of thriller middle school books into a play musical. And I'm involved with it and watching it develop. And it's fascinating. That's really cool. And, and there is no Rick Ellis anywhere in sight. If I, if I, yeah. Nice yeah. <laughs> we need Rick Ellis. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's all right. Um, you know, from the success of star catchers. And I know you, you said you're working on kingdom keepers kind of at the, at the same time, but um, for anyone that doesn't know kingdom keepers about a group of, of kids their hologram guides in the Disney parks during day, during the night, they're fighting Disney baddies, Disney villains all throughout the world. I believe Disney approached you, right? How did this all yeah. kind of come to be the Kingdom Keepers? Well, as and this I encourage all your listeners to think about, but as a kid, my parents told me and taught me to write thank you notes. Mm -hmm. for anything nice somebody did for me, whether it was a nice meal at somebody's house or a favor they do. So I do that. I'm still doing that in my life. And um, Dave and I, I was already working. Um, I wasn't working. No, I was not. I was not even working on uh, Peter and the Star Catchers yet. Dave, I went to Disney for the first time in my 40s with mm -hmm. my kids. I'd never been. Uh, my parents never took us. And um, I mentioned to Dave that I was going, and Dave Barry, and he said, "Well, look at I live in Florida. I know everything there is to know about Disney World. Why don't Why don't we meet up there and I'll show you around Disney World?" And um, and I, I thought that would be so much fun. So I uh, the thing the thing is is I always try to one up Dave because Dave yeah. just always Dave is so smart that he can always one ups you. So I, at that time, I was being published by a division of the Disney company um, that had um, a, a terrific, uh, you know, adult published book line called Hyperion. And so I called the uh, publisher, a friend of mine, and, and said, hey, is there anything you could do for Dave Barry and, and me when we go to um, the parks with our kids? Well, they gave us three days of the most special thing on earth. We had a VIP guy. Oh, that's awesome. They gave us all our passes. They, it, it, it was insane how much fun we had. So I wrote some thank you notes. And then it occurred to me after I had sent them that I should call. So I called my publisher to just rave about these three days we had spent. And he said, oh, no, you need to call Wendy Lefcon at Disney Books because all I did was call her and say, is there something you can do to help? And well, Wendy Lefcon had given us, you know, the trip yeah. of a lifetime. And she said, well, did you, did you like being in the park? I hear this was your first time. And I said, I loved being in the park because every attraction that you get on has a beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. And her eyes went wide and she said, so many people miss that. And I said, well, that's what you, as a storyteller, it just jumped out at me that at, at some, you know, some of these parks which shall go unnamed all they really want to do is make you throw up and you know the disney parks tell these stories in every attraction i think that's why we all can go on a multiple multiple times even on the same trip you can go what, what was the uh when you were uh seven doors mine train yeah the mine yeah. train you can go on the mine train like five times in a row oh, yeah. and see five different things because it's telling a story you just don't know it's telling a story um so one thing led to another, and she said, would you ever consider writing for kids? And I said, oh, yeah. I mean, I tell my kids stories. I'd love to. And and um, she said, we've been looking to write an exciting story for younger readers inside our parks, but we just can't put it together because as a company, we won't allow anybody to write about sabotage mm -hmm. or violence or missing children or anything. And yet we would like an exciting story inside our parks is, do you have any idea if you could do something like that? And I said, well, I'll try. And, and the first couple of tries I did, they didn't like. And then I got on to something about these um, kids actually being holograms and then all sorts of crazy stuff could happen to them, but they were really just projections and they, 
they and their attorneys loved that. They just thought that was so cool. And um, so I started goofing around with that in outlines. And then I called Wendy and I said, here's the problem. When I write, I observe and then I write and then I edit. An observation can be research in the library, online, um, and it can also be trying to be in the place the story takes place. And it's really the only way I know how to write is to observe and write and edit. So the problem here is I would need full access to your theme parks after everybody leaves at night. And there was just this blank silence. And Wendy said, uh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't think so, Yeah, but it's really the only way I could do this. And she said, well, I'll make some calls, but there's just no way this is ever going to happen. And then she called me back about a month later and said, uh, okay, uh, I've, got you, uh, I've got you a free pass to all the parks around the world. Um, you can go anytime you want. And I will arrange for you to meet an Imagineer if you want to go in at 4.30 in the morning and look around. Wow. And I started doing that. And my eyes got as big as saucers. And I said, there is this whole story that's happening here. And that the, the origin of the story has to do with my family. I don't want to bore you, but that, that's a, uh, a bigger story. But eventually, the Kingdom Keepers was born. That's so cool. And, and you kind of mentioned it with it about how you had this access to, to the park after hours and, and all over the world. You know, the original Kingdom Keepers has had seven original books. We'll talk a little bit about the revisions you're doing. Uh, there's been a second series. Um, you're working on a third series. There's a novella. There's a standalone book in the series. So it's so successful, and you've done so much research uh, for it. You visited the parks all around the world, the cruise line. But yeah. has what moments stick out to you the most when you're researching this, where you're standing there and you're saying, oh. I cannot believe I'm seeing this right now? That would take us four hours. <laughs> um, I mean... The most iconic moment I had is uh, has become iconic because it's in the first book. And um, it seems to be what everybody who reads that first book focuses on, which was um, I went my first trip. I went to uh, Disney World. I was accompanied by actually a little posse of Disney people. There was probably a lawyer in there I didn't know yeah. about. I mean, everybody was so terrified that a novelist was coming in after hours yeah. into their park. And, you know, after hours in Disney is um, it's pretty dark. There's no music. There are no people. And it's creepy. Just right off the bat, it's creepy. Sure, somebody might be painting some sign over on the right, but it's just creepy. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to Splash Mountain, Thunder Mountain, Space Mountain. And the last one we went to was It's a Small World. And uh, as I, they, they were really kind about allowing me to do this the way I wanted to do it. And what I did with each ride is I, with the ride shut off, I wanted to walk the emergency exit they have set up for everybody. So I could just see this thing, you know, under emergency lighting. What does it really look like when nobody's in here? And of course, they're all terrifying for all, all, all for different reasons. But I got um, on the end of that trip, I was in, in uh, Small World. And so I walked Small World and it took probably an hour um, with an Imagineer. And he was telling me about all the cool stuff and how they designed it. Mary Blair's influence, yep. and everything that went on. It was it was an amazing thing. And then uh, at the end, and they said, uh, we're assuming you would like to ride it. Um, would you like to, to turn on the ride and, and you can ride it before people show up? And I said, I would, but that was so fascinating to walk through there in the dark. I'd like to take a ride in the dark. And they, they kind of went, what? And I said, yeah, like no music and no lights. And, you know, the guy went over to the little booth and yep. kind of said, can we do this? And the person said, yeah, yeah, it's fine. So the Imagineer and I got in a boat and we started through the ride. And when there's no music, you hear the boat slosh. It's really eerie. Yeah. Um, and of course, you're not getting this thing stuck in your head that can't get out of your head for three weeks. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and with the emergency lights, all the shadows on the dolls are freaky Ugh. and really eerie. They, it is not the joyous little small world we think of. And we were probably 
we were either two or three scenes in. Each scene goes under a kind of an arch and you're in another room. And there are thousands, or certainly there are hundreds of dolls. And out of the corner of my eye, two of the dolls stepped forward. Oh, God. And I just jumped out of the boat. I'm skittish anyway. And and I just couldn't take that. I, I you know, jumped up, landed back down in the boat. The Imagineer's like, <laughs> what the heck are you doing? And I said, two of the dolls just moved. And the, and the guy looked at me like, you know, what are you on? And um, and he said, two of the dolls did not move. This ride is turned off. And I said, dude, those two dolls in France over there, they just <laughs> stepped forward. And Connor, they stepped <laughs> forward. I, I am an you. Eagle Scout, Scout's Honor. Those two dolls stepped forward. I saw it. And, and although you may think I'm loony, I have since talked to two different people who have also seen this happen. So I'm not the only person who has seen this happen. Anyway, it scared the pants off. <laughs> and I wrote, you know, I keep these notebooks around where, where I put all my, my writing notes in. And I wrote small world, um, you know, dark, dolls not moving, two of the dolls moved, scared the pants off. <laughs> and then I went back and wrote a chapter about the kids being in there. And I, I worked right to that moment where the two dolls stepped forward. And um, and I stopped and I thought, wait, you know, my as a novelist, what you do is you exaggerate the world. That's mm -hmm. what makes it interesting. And I was just writing something that had actually happened. This was like a memoir for me. And I said, I got to I got to exaggerate this thing. So I said, four of the dolls. Move. And I thought, ooh, that's creepier. That's even better. And then I thought, wait a second, I'm in a rock band with Stephen King. And I wrote all of the dolls. <laughs> and. And so the dolls move, they kind of move like Chucky in honor of Steven. Oh, and then they jump into the water and they're trying to swim mechanically. And some are just floating around and flopping and some are making it. And they're snapping at the kids and the kids start bleeding. And that's my vision of small world. But that freaky moment for me became this thing that ever, whenever I talk to people about the kingdom keepers, whether they're now 30 or whether they're 14, they go, what about small world? I go, sorry to tell you that happened. You know, so. Two things about that. One, it is very creepy at night, just around the park. You know, when I oh. worked at seven dwarfs mine train, one of the things we'd always have to do when we closed was take all the lost and found walk to the front of the oh, park yeah. at guest relations. So I would always want to do that task and I would do it because it was creepy, but I loved walking the streets when it was a little darker, no music, no one's there. And it would be like, like one, two in the morning, stuff like that. So you are yeah, right. And it's a about, place that holds 80,000 people. And right. There's nobody in it. Right. Just right there. That's creepy. And you, you think you hear things and I'm oh. sure there's other animatronics that are moving all the time too. I'm telling you. And I will say Ridley, you know, the first time I read that passage uh, uh, in the first Kingdom Keepers about It's a Small World, you know, man, you could write about, you know, blood of the albatross, gore, crime, whatever. <laughs> That's the scariest thing you've ever written in your whole life. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> you are you know, welcome. It wasn't even intended to be scary. It was just, I got so freaked out. I, but like I say, I mean, I could tell a hundred stories like this because it turns out that when you go in Disney, world after hours and on their ships and in disneyland 30 sometimes there are just a billion stories to tell because weird stuff happens and there's not it's a creepy place hey there i just wanted to take a quick break and mention a sponsor of the show we have today and the sponsor is actually a complete shameless plug because we're talking about my travel agent services if you've been listening to this show for a while, you probably know just how difficult it is these days to plan a great trip to Walt Disney World. Even in the past few years, uh, since the WDW Opinion Podcast has started, it's only really become more confusing to get to Walt Disney World. Things like knowing when to book, knowing how to book, and what to book, how to navigate around the parks with so many new additions, or even how to navigate all of the new technology you have to know about on your Walt Disney World vacation, it can all be challenging. Whether it's understanding the new Disney Genie service, or what Magic Mobile service is, or how to book park pass reservations, 
and why all of these new reservation systems are in place, it can seem like you practically need a master's degree in Disney to understand it all. Well, that's where your boy Connor comes in to play. Because as a Disney fanatic, I know Walt Disney World like the back of my hand. As a travel agent that specializes in Disney vacations, I participate in regular training that not only lets me know about the new things going on at Walt Disney World, but it also keeps me up to date with the vacation package offers, the deals, the specials that are currently going on, and I'm really able to stay in the loop because of my training as a Disney travel agent. And as a former Walt Disney World cast member, I have the behind the scenes expertise that I can share with you to help you navigate the parks like a pro. All these elements combined, me being a Disney fanatic, me being a Disney travel agent, me being a former Walt Disney World ca cast member, combine them all and that makes me the perfect fit to help you when it comes to booking your next perfect Disney vacation. I do the boring stuff, like finding deals, booking the trip, waiting on hold with Disney for hours on the phone, waking up super early to get those must-do dining reservations and special event tickets. I do that all so you don't have to. Let me do this for you so that you can focus on the most important part of a Disney vacation, and that's having fun. You have the fun, I do the lame stuff to ensure you have an even better time. And guess what, Opinioneers? The best part about this service? It's 100% free to use. You don't have to pay a dime to utilize my expertise. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and in fact, it can even help you save money because I am constantly looking for the best offers and the best deals that fit you and your family perfectly. But listen, don't just take my word for it. Hear from clients who have already utilized my services, like David M. from Maryland, who says, when it comes to mapping out what would be the best each day, what restaurants would be open or closed, what the flow would be like in the parks each day based on what was open, which even was changing when we arrived, Connor was always on point and had anticipated our needs. You should really take the time to invest in Connor's services. You won't be disappointed. Thank you, David, for those kind that kind review. And if you are ready to book your next trip, whether it's to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, Disney Cruise Line, or Adventures by Disney, reach out to me at Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com, and I can help you with all of that. That is Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com. Again, Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com, and I can help you plan your next perfect Disney vacation with this free-to-use service. You'd also be helping out the show a lot if you chose me for these services Again, Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com. Send an e email over to me. I'd love to help. Now, let's get back to the show. And, and there's so many stories to tell that you're doing something really, really cool with the original Kingdom Keepers. You're going back and you're, you're updating them. I know yeah. the first three have been revamped and, and republished. Talk a little bit about that, like what spurred you to do that and your process with updating them all. Yeah, we, you know, one of the honors of writing this is that readers tend to go in with their families and walk through the novels and follow the novels almost page by page and do what the Kingdom Keepers did. And um, this was something I never expected or would have even imagined, and certainly Disney didn't expect. So um, what happened is that the books continue to sell really well. Um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids read them every year. And the parks changed. 
And so if you can believe this, the, the readers of the Kingdom Keepers were going up to cast members and saying, hey, this thing on page 76 of book two, it's not here. What's going on? And Disney eventually wrote my editor and said, hey, this is becoming a problem because people are coming into the parks and they're disappointed. And we never want our guests to be mm -hmm. disappointed. Um, so we really we either need to stop publishing these books or we need to change the books. And so I had no desire to stop publishing the books. So I just told them that for free, I would rewrite the series. Um, and I have. I mean, I'm I'm on book six now. Wow. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is write fun, exciting books set in the same places as before, but with a little less specificity. So they might make it another 15 or 20 years without needing another rewrite. Yeah. Because to their credit, Disney is constantly changing their parks. Sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. People like you, Connor, see it and understand it. People like Lou Mangiello. Yeah. But, um, you know, people like like I, I might, I might go through a park and not notice at all that the Sleeping Beauty ride had been, attraction had been taken out. Um, it might take me months to figure that out. And um, when you put it in a book, it makes it a little permanent. Exactly. So I've really had fun because I'm, I'm a more mature writer now. I, it's been 20 years, 15, 20 years. And um, I'm making the book shorter and more compact and I hope super exciting. So we'll see. I think so it's so far the first three have been received really well. So I, I hope these next few will be too. It's it's so cool just because it it connects with what the parks really are. Like you said, yeah. the parks are constantly being revamped. I mean, Walt Disney himself said Disneyland will never be complete. As long as there's imagination in the world, it will constantly be updated. Imagineer and legend Marty Scalar said kind of the same thing. This isn't a museum. We're constantly updating things. So for you to kind of do the same with the books, you know, not only That's is true. it going. Yeah, I'm following in that tradition. You are. Marty Scalar was a good friend and a, just an amazing man and such a loss. But he helped the Kingdom Keepers series so much. He was the first person to read them after my editor. Wow. Um, and he was amazing. That's you know, awesome. Just so helpful. I got his book right there. Dream yeah, it, do it. I've, He's, I've I mean, got, I've got his book here too. That's and it's. I just, I just love. You know, when I first heard that that they were getting updated, I was, I was so excited, and I just thought, gosh, what a, what a really, really good idea. I would had, had I known in my teens that there was something called an Imagineer and what they did, I would have devoted my whole life to trying to be one of those guys. Oh yeah, and gals, oh, and yeah. engineers, and artists, and you know, architects, and I mean. Those people have some amazing jobs they do. And, um, and I, you know, I wanted to be Imagineer for sure. I think yeah. a, a lot of us, you know, did. I, I think once so I, do I, yeah, once I realized, oh, maybe there's more math involved. I, uh, you know, that's, I can't, can't do that. <laughs> you know, that's the beauty of that. it. I mean, they have, you know, the, the thing that Wendy told me when I first told her about the beginning, middle and end being in every attraction, she said, do you know that the Imagineers write a book? Yeah. about each of these attractions. It's a storybook um, that follows the storyline and then they build the ride accordingly. And these things, she said, these things are like 80 page books. And I, and I had no idea, but I, now that I know that the book is there for them to base it off of, I see so much more story in every attraction I go on. And, and it's ever changing. It's ever changing. And, and that's why they work too, beginning, yeah. middle and end. And, you know, as you're updating these books you're also working on on new books in the series as well yeah. i know the newest uh it's kind of a a third series in the King, King, kingdom keepers inheritance yeah. that's coming out shortly oh my gosh is it exciting yeah so talk a little bit you know how is this going to differ from the other series i know it's been uh it's been ready to go for a while hasn't it the book yeah, yeah. I didn't know you knew that. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> been sitting on a desk somewhere in Disney for four years. Oh my gosh! Um, but you know, I I don't I, I I don't think many authors want to repeat themselves. So I didn't. Um, I wasn't done. I knew I wasn't done with the Kingdom Keepers after book seven. And book seven, I wrote with my readers. I wrote with one hundred and fifty thousand of my readers from around the world through a very elaborate app that we had. Yeah. And, and 
I had the most amazing readers. I mean, they were writing pieces of the book every week with me, and it was an amazing experience. But I, I just sensed at the end of that, this the story isn't done. I don't know what it would be. And eventually, I, I realized I would love to know about the first few weeks, months of Disneyland's early beginnings. And that became a series called The Kingdom Keeper's Return. Mm-hmm. Um and it's three books long and it, researching that was so incredible. I spent so much time at Disneyland and in the archives um, with Becky and Kevin and others um, digging through, you know, those early days. There's some incredible stories in there. I'm sure you've heard those. But uh, and then my editor came to me and said, um, it, you know, is there is there more Kingdom Keepers you want to write? And I really had to think about that because I just didn't want to repeat. I, you know, I've I've done the pretty much done the cruise ships. I've done both parks. Um, I've done Disney World in depth. I could do a little more in Disneyland, I think, someday. But what what appealed to me, because this is what I hope makes people read a book, is the characters. And I got to thinking about the characters, and I thought. You know, by the end of book seven, we know these characters pretty well. And and I think we have a sense of that their story is it's not over, but that uh, exciting action packed part of their lives is probably coming to a close. And then I thought, what about their children? And that just lit me up. So Kingdom Keepers Inheritance is about the children of the Kingdom Keepers and the kingdom keepers that you thought might like each other did like each other, and they had children, and so their children can push, or their children can dream the future. Um, so, you know, there's a mixture of the fairlies and the kingdom keepers, and I have had so much fun just tearing loose into... The other thing I wanted to cover was that Walt had established Epcot originally in his brilliant mind. He had thought someday this will be a community, kind of like Silicon Valley. It would be a community of artists and engineers and interested people in creating things, and they would all work together, and they'd have meals in Epcot, the, the, you know, the, the attraction of Epcot, but there'd be 60,000 people living around that park. And I, I thought that I owed it to the Imagineers and to Walt to envision that for everyone. It would just be my vision, not everybody's vision, and and there's probably much better visions of it than mine. But so I've set these in a slightly futuristic, maybe 10, 15 years down the road from now. A little more, there's a little more uh, high tech in the parks and in the living areas. But, um, you know, what would it have been like if they had put 60,000 people in homes around that park? And then what would the kids be like in those in almost a suburban setting to an attraction. It's kind of a sub-attraction setting. Uh, and so that's the inheritance. And um, the, the uh, you know, the magic comes from everything Epcot. I love Epcot. And as I traveled the world more looking at Disney parks, as Disney encouraged me to write more about their world parks, um, and I've been to many, many, not all, but many, many, many of them. Um, I thought, well, Epcot's perfect for this because Epcot has the world showcase. So if I can think of a way that portals might exist between like France in, in Epcot and the real France, you know, a real time yeah. portal where you're just, you're, you're in France and Epcot one minute, and then you're on the streets of Paris the next minute that that could be a really interesting imaginative world to write in. And so that's what the three, uh, the three books will be. I'm just, I'm just starting the second now. That's so cool. It it sounds so cool too. And I remember the blurb I read for, for this first one. I, that's exactly what I thought. It's very old school experimental prototype community of tomorrow. I mean, I think, even in the blurb, it mentioned something, uh, Communa Tree, which reminded right. me of Communa Core. So it's yeah. very, so I'm super excited uh, to, to you know, read that. When the Imagineer that. showed me those plans, and, and you can see them if, if you're creative and look around. Mm-hmm. I, think, uh, I think even in Magic Kingdom, you can find images of them over there near the Italian restaurant. But um, 
when you look down, you know, they have they have uh, reliefs of looking down at the community and they looked like flowers to me. Oh, wow. Coming off of a stem. And I thought, oh, it's a community. Oh, that's so cool. So wow. it was really off the artist's reproduction. There was another mention in, in the blurb that I read about how there was this Villains Park in Hong Kong. And uh-huh. Villains Park has been a long rumor in the Disney fan community. Everyone has always said that would be a great fifth gate at Walt Disney yeah. World, a theme park dedicated just to uh, uh, villains. So, you know, I have to ask Ridley, uh, do you know something that we don't know? <laughs> Sometimes I know something you don't know, not in that regard. <laughs> okay. Um, but I will say that the at the start of book two, which I'm writing right now, it's it's no longer just Hong Kong that has a villain's realm. So wow. look out. Okay. Look out world. So, you know, you talked about how you you loved writing these characters, but you knew that there was going to be something more with them. And that's where inheritance came into play with right. with a new group of characters. You've created characters from scratch, and you've also created characters that already existed, already had a backstory, whether it was the Peter Pan characters or the, the, the Disney villains, the Disney characters. From your perspective, what's harder to write? One where you have to start from scratch or one that has this backstory that people already know about, people have preconceived notions are they kind of equal to create or, or well, the latter is more tricky because yeah. you make people mad. Right. You know? um, so no one you know, in the Disney community gets mad. I don't know what you're talking about, Ridley. No, yeah. never. <laughs> never. Um, you don't get any mail. That says, no, How no. dare you do that? It's Maleficent. <laughs> um, but so Dave and I created some really fun villains for Peter and the star catchers. And with the kingdom keepers, I really have to deal and, and I'm, and I'm honored to deal with their existing characters. So I do push those characters in, in Ridley directions. And thankfully I have um, my editor, Wendy Lefcon, and she has, um, you know, this big posse of fact checkers and things. And when I go too far, they, they pull the reins in. So, you know, in all my discarded pages around this office, um, there's, you know, there are different characters than you could ever imagine in your parks, but uh, they, they hold me back and say, please don't go there. And, and they don't thank, you know, in, in their credit to their credit, they don't say go here with them. They just say, don't go there, try something different. And so I'll experiment around and say, what if, what if this character did this? And they'll go, Ooh, creepy fun. Yeah. And that's within our world. Good. And then I'll say, what about that? And they go, no, 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 no. Can't go there. Uh, and sometimes I have learned, over the over the years I've been doing this, sometimes it's simply because they've been working on something, they being the Imagineers, for like six years, and I've tapped into it. Oh wow! And they're like, okay, freak, stop. <laughs> you know, we're, we're both thinking the same thing, and they're saying you are not beating us to the finish line with this. And things move slower at Disney than yep. writing a book. You know, so I mean, it takes a decade to make these attractions, and they'll be like, okay. Just stop right there and don't ever think another thought along those lines. And I'll go, okay, I'm out. Uh, so I, I, there's another series I'm dying to write for them. And I had brought it up, um, gosh, five years ago now, six years ago. And my editor, who's plugged into everything Disney, said, oh, cool idea. We're not doing anything with that. Hmm. And um, so I got really excited about it and I pitched him all this stuff and it just kind of sat around. Um, and then I, you know, raised the question through my agent with my, my editor again and said, you know, what about that? What about that idea? And when he came back and said, okay, we're not talking about that idea at all. Just huh. forget we ever talked about that idea. So uh, something's coming big, uh, but I wasn't allowed to even think about it anymore. Oh man, now you just got my my gears turning in my head. Yeah, thinking you'll, this you'll stuff. figure it out. Oh it's a tough boy, one. oh boy. Wow, because that's... it's very it was way in the background. It was something I just discovered um on a sign oh, in boy. um both in Disney Japan and um and in Disney World. It was kind of a toss away thing. And then um I found it in a more contemporary setting in Disney. 
Mm. And that's when they said, okay, shut up. Don't say a thing. We've got this covered. Oh, so man. I'm not allowed to write about it. Well, I'm super intrigued now, whatever it might be. And, and you'll have to tell me when it does get created, whenever it does, what it was, because I'd, I'd love to know. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you would. This is uh, this has been awesome, Ridley. I've had I've had so much fun. I've learned so much. Um, I want to thank you for your time. You've been oh, incredibly so hospitable. Thank it was you, Connor, for having me on. It was awesome. Um, please, you know, tell uh, the good people out there listening the next books, whether they're the revamped originals or the new trilogy. I, do you have any dates that are coming out? I do. I have some fun stuff to talk about. So in March of 2022. Finally, Inheritance is going to come out. Cool. Um, and it's called Kingdom Keepers Inheritance, book one. Uh, it will be joined, I believe, if I'm correct. I, I believe I'm correct in this. Uh, at the same time, we will release the new editions of book four and book five gotcha. of the original Kingdom Keepers series. Uh, in, in June of 2022, we will release books uh, six and seven of the new edition of Kingdom Keepers. That is, if I get off of this call, Connor. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm um, trying. <laughs> and uh, the, a really fun project. Disney came to me a couple years ago and asked if I would be interested in writing a, a series of short stories that dealt with iconic Disney characters, but pushed them into the scary zone. Oh, and I have worked with this um, amazing, amazing editor within Disney, um, Lauren Berniak, and she has held my feet to the fire on this project. I came up with a really weird idea to connect all eight short stories with a story of their own. And she allowed me to do that and helped me do this and coached me through it and um, right around Halloween of 2022, so about a year from now, uh, Cautionary Tales will come out. Cautionary Tales. And I am so proud of this book. We have an amazing illustrator. Uh, but these these stories are so fun. And they they take so, talk about, you know, taking a Disney character you thought you knew. Um, well, these characters go way out of where you thought you knew them. So I'm very excited and Hopefully you'll be hiding under your covers. Oh, hey, I hope so too. In a in a weird way, um, they all sound super cool. Super excited for all of them. We'll share with the listeners and remind the listeners when they all come out. We'll include show uh, uh, links to all of your stuff too, where they can buy books, learn more yeah, about right. you in the and show notes. I think page. we're gonna have some big news, and and maybe I can. Um, talk about that on the program with you sometime in the future. You never know. Absolutely. We'll definitely have you back on. Ridley, thank you so very you much can. for being here today. Sure appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Man, oh man, wasn't that an awesome conversation with Ridley Pearson? Thanks so much to him for being on the show today. Again, if you go over to wdwopinion.com slash 116, You'll be able to access the show notes page for this episode, and you can get links to all of Ridley's social media uh, profiles, where you can buy his new books, all that fun stuff. Head over to wdwopinion.com slash 116 to check it out. If you enjoyed today's episode and you are on YouTube, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment letting me know what you enjoyed most about this interview. And if you have a favorite Kingdom Keepers book, like which one you like the best, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. For those peeps listening on Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe to the show there do me a huge favor, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts as well. It really helps new folks find the show with each additional Apple review that we get. And of course, future reviews will be read on the air. If you listen on Spotify, click that follow button on the show notes show page as that will help us out as well. In between episodes, the best way to talk Disney with me and your fellow Disney fanatics is by joining the WDW Opinioneers Facebook group. 
You can connect with your fellow Disney fans. You talk Disney all the time. Head over to wdwopinioncom slash opinioneers. That's O-P-I-N-I-O-N-E-E-R-S to join the conversation. If you do like the show, another huge favor you could help me out with is by sharing the show with someone else you think might enjoy it. If they love Walt Disney World, share it with them, whoever it may be. And of course, like I mentioned before, if you are ready to book a vacation to Walt Disney World or Disneyland or Adventures by Disney or Disney Cruise Line, I'd be love I'd love to help you out with that. And as a Disney specialized travel agent, I can help you do so with my free to use services. Reach out to me at Connor C O N O R at WDWOpinion.com. Um, and of course, if there is ever anything I could ever do to help you out, whether it's answering a question or getting a comment or what have you, let me know. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Connor, C-O-N-O-R at WDWOpinion.com. That's going to do it for me this week. If you liked what you heard today, then you've been listening to the WDW Opinion Podcast. If by chance you did not like what you heard, then you've been listening to The Athletic Football Show. I've been Connor Brown, and until next time, keep LTD living the dream, and I'll see you real soon.